morning, everyone. Welcome to Unite SPLD 2019. Has it been good so far? Yes? yes? <laughs> well, um, it's always an honour to be given the opportunity to share with everyone here about issues that matter to us as we work with families and children who are living with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. And today's topic, I think, is particularly important. It's very real, it's very raw. Um, it's probably close to many of our hearts. Today we'll explore, within 40 minutes, um, poverty and learning disabilities. Research has shown a growing relationship between poverty and learning disabilities. And I mean, as we continue to work with our learners in the area of learning disabilities um, on issues such as identification, screening, assessment, intervention, awareness, advocacy, training, it's important that we are mindful of this particular population or this group within those who have learning disabilities who might then be doubly disadvantaged. Those who might have a learning disability and have to continue to deal with financial challenges at home. And we know this at the DAS, we are experiencing this at the DAS. As Eric had mentioned just now, 52% of the children who received intervention um, in the main literacy program in 2018 received bursaries in order to access that intervention. And if you think about the students who received bursaries, 56% of them actually received 100% bursaries, which means that they received intervention for free. So clearly at the DAS, we see this to be a big overlap. Children who have learning disabilities and are financially challenged. So for us to best understand what this, might, this experience must be like, perhaps we should walk the shoes of someone who's going through this. In this video, you will hear from a parent whose child is currently attending the DAS uh, program and is receiving bursaries in order to do so. So let's hear from her about her experiences. Dyslexia is a brain-based language learning difference which often impacts an individual's ability to read, write or spell. Individuals with dyslexia often encounter difficulties with memory, orientation and organisation too. Dyslexia is a lifelong condition that usually runs in families. It is a hidden disability, therefore children with dyslexia are often misunderstood and can be mistaken for being lazy, stupid or unmotivated. Early identification and providing early intervention means giving a child with dyslexia the right kind of help and will have a huge impact on them. With this support, they will not be left behind the rest of the class, will struggle less and will help raise their self-esteem and confidence in learning, helping them to reach their full potential. DAS believes that no child should be left behind because he or she cannot afford the cost of a DAS education. Every year, DAS provides more than $1 million in bursaries for low-income families to access our specialist services. This figure is rising. Hi, my name is uh, Madam Bibi Zulaika. I'm 42 years old this year, and uh, I have my, my boy, it's Bilal Nasrallah bin Amir Naina Muhammad. He's going to be six this year. I try not to do, I try not to compare, but you know, as parents, we just can't help it. We will, we will compare the kids. Like, so there's so much different within with his cousins, same age as him. Uh, that time I was four years old, able to read and able to, you know, understand and I was quite worried, so that's the reason why I actually got referred to go to KKH to get him checked when he was four years old. They actually said that yeah, his motor skill is strong. What I was thinking is poor, uh, so he needs he needs to to um, brush it up before he goes to P1. You will not know about this un until you yourself experience it. So when I experienced it with my boy. Uh, I was a bit taken aback, I was like, okay, what should I do, what should I do? And it's beyond my, you know, I can't help me much. So they need special teachers, special dedicated teachers to help. With the help from the, uh, the, uh, the, the bursary, it helps me a lot financially and emotionally, not having to feel stressed. 
know, to think of how am I able to provide for him. Um, when he was two, his father passed away. So um, I'm not working. So I was thinking, I want the best for him, of course. But without this, I couldn't afford. My, my husband was the main breadwinner. So when he passed away, I stayed with my parents. So, so we have to change everything, you know, schooling and everything, the area. And my father is also retired. He's already retired last year. It's not easy for a long term. For short term, it's different, but it's a long term. That means from four until he have to be until P1. I was thinking, you know, I have to all these things. So it um, helps a lot. Like it helps me a lot in this. Without the support from DAS, I don't think I'd be able to provide to send him for this special uh, education that he needs. And uh, on my own, I think it's, it's, it's difficult. DAS supports more than 3,500 students with learning differences. In 2017, 50% of DAS families required bursaries to access our identification and intervention services to enable their children to receive the professional support they needed. Knowing him, you know, uh, now he's very uh, outgoing and he will make sure that when he asks a question, you have to answer him and most of the time he will be asking the questions like I think the, his confidence level now increases. I can see so much different in him, um, like especially now he speaks much better in English and in full sentences and I can see now he is very he likes to rhyme words like he says my name is Bilal I'll change to R become Rilal or without the B it become Ilal which I'm very happy and surprised that before he can't even read his own name you know without the support from the generous people and organizations of Singapore children like Bilal would not have access to the specialized help they need to reach their full potential please consider donating now So, Madam Bibi's story, Bilal's story, is a happy one. You see that the child received the help in order to receive intervention, is making positive changes, and that's, um, that's made, it made a big difference to the parent and to the child. But if that support, um, financial support, wasn't available to a child with learning disabilities, if you recall at the start of the video, the anxiety, the despair that she, she showed as she was talking about that situation, um, that would be a reality for many children if financial, uh, the financial situation is not addressed while we try and help with their learning disabilities. So this morning, we'll, we'll explore the areas or the relationship between poverty and learning disabilities by first setting the scene. Let's understand what poverty is, what its place is in Singapore. Then we'll look at how these dual conditions impact learning and quality of life. And finally, let's see if we can change that narrative for this group of people and their children. So first off, right at the onset, I must say poverty is not equal to a learning disability, right? Poverty doesn't cause learning disabilities. Years of research has warned us against making such an association. In fact, what we want to understand, therefore, is the impact of poverty on a child with learning disabilities. And one way to consider this then is to perhaps look at Morton and Firth's causal modelling framework, which came out in 1995. And if you can see there, there are four main categories, the biological, the cognitive, the behavioural and the environment. And so very quickly, biological perspectives uh, provide the genetic, biochemical and neurophysiological explanations to why a child might be having these difficulties, um, which you see in learning. The cognitive refer to the mental processes, areas like attention, memory, um, phonological processing, and again, that gives us an, an understanding, an explanation to why the child might be struggling at certain literacy or learning tasks. The third category there is the behavioural, which one will argue is the most obvious and visible to see. Um, and those are what we would see when a child is actually struggling with learning, so difficulties in reading, difficulties in writing and spelling, etc. Now, these three areas are impacted by the environment, and that's where you would situate poverty. Poverty impacts home and family factors and resources, and so the environment impacts one's learning, and these are then externalised through perhaps the behavioural um, symptoms that you might see. 
So as I was reading up on this topic and putting together information for this presentation, it became quickly evident that a lot of studies focusing on learning disabilities or reading disabilities exclude children coming from low-income households. And that's probably to control the variables, to ensure that the difficulties that, one, that we study from these children are purely a result for, of a learning disability rather than the impact of environment, environmental factors like poverty. But at the same time, some research has suggested that we review or look at poverty as an additive risk factor, a co-occurring condition. So perhaps it will be useful to think about how um, we think about ADHD um, impacting dyslexia or dyslexia impacting um, executive functioning difficulties. So poverty, therefore, becomes a co-occurring condition, a comorbid. Um, some research has suggested that poverty is the new morbidity when it comes to learning disabilities. So now let's just take a general look at how poverty impacts learning. Um, in a study that looked at factors that contributed to student achievement, it found that home and family factors contributed 49%, nearly 50%, to student achievement. In contrast, uh, class sizes impacted 8%, uh, teacher achievement and qualifications 43%. So clearly home and family factors are a significant contributor to student achievement and this is what poverty largely impacts as well. And another study, this was in the US, and here I'd just like you to turn your attention to the graphs here. So the one on the top, that focuses on a learning disabled population. And if you look at the learning disabled population graph, you can see that green bar, that refers to children who come from low-income households. So, in a learning disabled population, 28% of the children were found to, have, uh, to come from low-income households. Right? That dotted line that runs down through both graphs, that, that refers to the global prevalence rate of dyslexia. So, almost three times as many children in a learning disabled population will come from low-income households as dyslexics in a general population. And that's a significant number. Now, if you look at the second graph, the one below, that looks at the low-income population, right? So children who are dealing with poverty issues. You see a staggering 84% of children with a learning disability. And this, again, is a significant overlap. So clearly, it, it's, it's becoming very evident that many children with learning disabilities also live in um, poor conditions or within poverty circumstances. So studies have suggested some re reasons for why that might be, and one is the genetic linkage theory. Dyslexia, for example, we know is hereditary. And studies show that households with a family member with a learning disability have significantly lower income. So there seems to be some impact to, uh, with learning disability and household income. And when they went further to understand and compare how affluent families and families in, in, in poverty conditions uh, deal with learning disabilities, it became clear as well through those studies that families living um, under financial challenges will be more impacted if their child has additional needs, for instance, if the child has a learning disability. So a little bit more about uh, genetic links is, the, the, is, is this idea of cultural capital, which is the subtle transmission of advantages or disadvantages. So what that means really, for example, is if I come from an affluent family as a parent, I will be more confident about myself and confident about the abilities of my children. And that confidence gets transmitted to the child. The child begins to think highly of himself or herself as well. Um, Besides that, there is access to resources. I am able to provide the necessary resources to help the child's learning needs. I'm also able to guide the child because I feel competent myself. Um, in the cases where I lack the skills and expertise to help my child, I am able to surround myself with the right network of people and I'm able to empower myself through training to be able to provide that guidance to my children. Now, in contrast, if a, if a parent is dealing with both learning disabilities and financial challenges, they may actually feel incapacitated, overwhelmed by what they're expected to be able to help their child with when it comes to their learning. Just think about the everyday situation. Perhaps now we've got a bit of a break because it's the school holidays, but when school starts, homework is an almost daily affair, right? And I mean, I speak from my own experience. When my nine-year-old brings me his math work sometimes, I'm stumped. 
I, I'm embarrassed to say it, but yes, I'm sometimes stumped and I have to Google and answer, figure out how to give the right way to solve that problem. Sometimes I turn to my friends um, who are in the industry to better understand what's the right model to draw here and what's the right statement I should apply. Yep. But if you think about a family where the parents, perhaps one of them has a learning disability and they're financially challenged, they may not be in a position to help the child. They might have their own challenges as well. And this becomes very frustrating. Um, there is also this other universal principle, principle when it comes to parenting. I think all parents here would agree that we all want our children to do better than us. We want our children to outdo us and outperform us. Yet if you think about a, a parent who has a learning disability or comes from um, or, with, or has financial challenges, imagine that experience when you're talking to the teacher and the teacher tells you about all the challenges your child has. And perhaps what runs through your mind is, I had these challenges when I was young, you know, um, I struggled. Perhaps this is what my child is capable of. This is, perhaps he can do a little bit better than me, but this is it. There is a possibility that you benchmark the child, you lower expectations, and if resources are limited, you may consider diverting the resources to something that perhaps is more, you're, you're in more need of than something like tuition or intervention. Now, how does all of this apply to Singapore? Frankly, when you think of poverty, I don't think you think of Singapore. What visions or images come to mind when you think of poverty? I, I think you'd think of um, homeless people. I think you might think of young children who are dressed in perhaps dirty clothes, uh, a nine-year-old raising a toddler, walking the streets. I mean, these are the images I think media has also shared with us and our own experiences as we travel. This, this is what you think of when you think of poverty. Singapore really doesn't fit those images, right? Um, and not surprisingly, we are among the top of the world when it comes to social mobility, which means that uh, a present generation does better than the previous generation. We seem to be doing well. Um, and there are no uh, published statistics on poverty in Singapore. There is no poverty line that has been defined. So if you think about what international researchers and organizations would then define as poverty, it's been suggested that um, households whose incomes are less than half the median household income of the population would be considered poor. Now, if you apply that definition to Singapore's population, it's suggested that 20% of our population would actually be considered poor. Right? And that's, I think, uh, an important thing to consider. A fifth of our population would be considered poor. In 2018, a study was done, and Singaporeans were surveyed, and 50% of the Singaporeans uh, felt that the widening class divide was the greatest social issue to face Singapore in the recent years. And this suggests, therefore, uh, a lessening of faith or, 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 or a belief, a lessening of that belief uh, of meritocracy within Singapore society. Moving from social mobility to academic resilience, Singapore has a very fine education system. It's very uh, well governed, it's well resourced, um, and we clearly do very well in international reports and examinations. And org the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development reported this based on 72 economies. And Singapore did very well when it came to academic resilience. Uh, nearly half of Singapore's 15-year-old disadvantaged students ranked in the international top quarter of disadvantaged students. So not your typical learners, but your disadvantaged students, who therefore did better than expected. On average, most economies uh, achieved a 30% rate. So our near 50% rate does suggest that we have a lot of academic resilience amongst our learners. The question for us then is at what cost? What is the cost of us being able to achieve these sort of numbers? Now, a study done by HSBC reported that Singapore ranks third globally in the amount of money parents spend on education for their children. So parents spend, on average, in Singapore, $96,000 a year on educating their children. I pause for a moment. $96,000 a year. That's nearly double the amount that is spent globally elsewhere, on average, right? Um, Mr. Anurag Mathur, who is the head of retail banking and wealth management in HSBC, had this to say, in today's highly competitive global job market, education has never been more important. Singaporean millennials' parents are investing both their time and money to help their children get the best start in life. 
Um, not to criticize that, but now consider the child or the family that is in poverty conditions, that's financially disadvantaged. And think of the child who therefore has additional needs who, because of learning dif difficulties. Will these families be able to spend anywhere near this amount in order to catch up with their peers? So that's the question for us. Which we will now try and understand better by exploring how learning disabilities and um, financial challenges impact areas of learning and living. First, let's look at the home language and literacy environment. And we know that especially in the early years, child literacy learning is linked to many things related to the home. Parental education, the resources that we are able to provide through the amount of um, the money that we have at home, the significance and the emphasis placed on literacy learning pursuits, and the nature of talk directed to preschoolers. Now at this point, when we talk of, when we, we, we mention nature of talk, we, we don't just mean the exposure the quality and quantity of exposure to language. We also mean the perspectives that are shared about learning through talk. Um, we know that language is a very important instrument to define your worldview, to define how you think, your critical thinking skills, to encourage the inquisitive mind of young learners. So the nature of talk here refers to even how language is utilized in order to encourage this sort of uh, mental development or cognitive stimulation. Now, all of these can be either an access to or defined as engage or enrichment experiences, sorry. And the level of engagement with these experiences will impact literacy development. So at this point, let's focus purely on homeschool connections because that's where learning largely takes place or is defined as to how well you are learning and, and what is expected at home and how in families where there are financial challenges as well as learning impairment, there is often a disconnect. Let's talk first about illiteracy. Many of the students we meet at the DAS, a sizable number of them, will tell us that they are looked after by their grandparents. This is quite common in Singapore, um, where the grandparents look after the children. And when we talk to these uh, children, we realize that it's not English they speak at home. It's not even the mother tongue languages of Chinese, Malay, or Tamil. It's in fact dialect sometimes. Right? So if you talk about illiteracy, perhaps even focusing on illiteracy in terms of the instructional language in Singapore, which is English, many of these children are not able to follow up with that sort of exposure and support at home. Right? So again, imagine the child with homework that they need to do. Imagine a child with learning disabilities who is obviously struggling a little bit in school or maybe a lot more. And coming home and not having that sort of uh, interaction or, or access in terms of support um, because the person who is looking after them, the caregiver, doesn't speak that language. The next point, of course, is resources. And some homes don't have books, um, magazines, they don't have software, they don't have a computer. Um, in such situations, many children who need that reinforcement, you think of a learner with dyslexia, you think of the, ne the, the need for repetition, you think of reinforcement at home, and these children may not have that environment at home because they lack those resources. Yeah? Um, here we might take reference to the square root rule that was proposed, where if you think of a typical learner, a typical learner takes 16 hours to learn something. A learner with dyslexia takes square root that time, so 16 square root 4, 4 times 16 hours, which I think is 64 hours, to learn that same thing. So that reinforcement at home, that repetition at home is critical. And if they lack, for example, e-learning opportunities, they lack books, magazines, um, access to good programs, um, then this becomes impacted as well. And often when we think, of, we think of financial challenges, we think in terms of money and the materials that can be um, obtained um, or not because they lack those resources. But time also is a critical factor when it comes to those who are financially challenged. In Professor Teo's book, This is What Inequality Looks Like, she um, has interviews with families living in such disadvantaged backgrounds. And one of the things they mention is that time is very scarce for, for them. I mean, they work long shifts, long hours, sometimes night shifts, which means they are resting during the day. Their work is very laborious. So having the time to sit with their children and actually work through things like homework may actually not be possible for that group of people. right? And lastly, language and mindset. We touched a little bit on language, so let's focus on mindset. Um, in the same book by Professor Teo, she, she quotes some parents feeling, especially parents obviously from, with financial challenges and uh, who have 
children with additional needs, feeling that education is not within their sphere of influence or responsibility. They feel their primary responsibility is to ensure that there's food on the table, a roof over their head, to ensure the safety of their children and areas like health. But as far as education is concerned, that should be handled in school. And that's because, again, of their limited resources. They're focusing on what, or they're prioritizing on what they can influence better, right? And, and therefore, they're, they're not able to, or they're not, they don't consider the importance of helping the child at home as far as learning is concerned. That's the school's responsibility. Now, if I flip that to the teacher, there's also a, a comment to be made about the mindset of teachers sometimes. Um, I was watching this film, Bridge to Terabithia, with my kids a few weeks ago. And in one scene there, the teacher tells her 12-year-olds to watch a documentary and then to write a report after that. Now, the female protagonist raises her hand in, the, you know, in front of all her friends and says, what if we can't watch that program? And the teacher immediately assumes it's because a parent might not let her watch TV on a school night or something. And she says, don't worry, if you tell your parent that it's for an assignment, she will let you watch it. And then she has to raise her hand sheepishly again and say, what if you don't have a TV? Right, so I mean, sometimes there is an assumption that this help will be provided at home um, and that parents need to find the resources in order to ensure that extra support is given at home. So the, ne the necessity to understand the family factors and to manage expectations is another thing that we need to consider. And sometimes there is that disconnect when there is that lack of understanding. Now we switch gears, we look at quality of life. And um, all of us here, as we work with children with learning uh, disabilities, we, we don't just stop at working with them as far as schooling is concerned. Our responsibility doesn't end with what happens in school. It's actually about enabling them to live a meaningful and joyful life. Quality of life extends beyond what happens in school. And therefore it's important that we consider how um, poverty and learning disabilities impact quality of life. The former US President, President Johnson, is actually credited to be one of the first people to bring this concept to the fore. And he says, the great society is concerned not with how much, but with how good. Not with the quantity of goods, but with the quality of its members' lives. So, right at the start, we know that dyslexia impacts quality of life, and it goes beyond uh, impacting reading, spelling, and writing. Although traditionally or immediately when you think of dyslexia, you think of the literacy challenges. But it does permeate many aspects of one's life. Um, a sense of self, which develops through childhood, through school, then in adulthood, uh, in adulthood through employment at the workplace. It does define who you are. And it's important, therefore, that we help the child find a positive way of defining herself or, or himself when it comes to dyslexia and other learning disabilities. It also impacts your communication. And here, we're, we don't just want to focus on written com communication. It's also about verbal communication. It's also about socializing. So imagine a child who has difficulties um, with body language, reading body language, or facial expression, or even um, understanding sarcasm. Um, socializing, developing the right sort of um, networks might also be impacted. Job interviews. Um, difficulties um, managing or not interviewing well would mean that you are limited in terms of the kind of jobs that you can seek. And lastly, something like driving. So this happened to me in class. My, my student um, who's, who's struggling to read, who was struggling to read, um, said, oh, teacher, I can never drive. So I said, but why? Why can't you drive? And she said, oh, I can't even read. I mean, imagine if I'm driving, I'll be reading all the road signs. I won't be able to figure out. I'll be going around in circles. You know? Of course, she laughed. I laughed, and I told her, don't worry, I'm sure we'll figure this out. And right now, Google Maps does it for you, so maybe you don't really need to worry about being able to read science anymore. But the fact of the matter is, something as routine as driving could be impacted, and that could impact your quality of life. I mean, think of mobility, right? Think of, of being able to read science and navigating your way across the streets of Singapore. Um, this impacts how much freedom or liberty you have to move. So dyslexia does impact quality of life. And it doesn't just impact the individual's life, it impacts those around them. And this comes from Marion Wolfe, where she says, when a child has dyslexia, there are no unaffected relatives in the family. We are all affected every day as anyone who has a child, grandchild, or sibling with dyslexia knows. So what is quality of life? Where there are five factors here, you have health, physical environment, productivity, emotional well-being, and family interactions. 
And for those of you who are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you might see similarities. You can actually relate to what's in uh, that pyramid to these factors in terms of quality of life. And if you look at the bottom, the two bottom levels of the pyramid, mm -hmm. that's safety and physiological. And without the achievement of these, it's very hard to achieve the higher levels of um, content or satisfaction in terms of, say, self-actualization. Right? So what we want to focus on today, because we don't have much time, but the slides that will be shared with you will actually cover all of these factors. All right? but this morning, we'll just touch on emotional well-being as a quality of life factor, right? Now, for any of us who's ever been in the situation where, the, where you know, you're, you're running low of cash, right? I mean, as a student, we probably have had that experience before. Perhaps even as adults, we've had that experience where bills are there and, you know, you're running low of cash. You've got to juggle your finances. We know how stressful that situation can be. Now, imagine that to be a monthly or a daily affair. And immediately, I think, if you're, if you're visualizing it well, I think you should be seeing, feeling your, your heartbeat rising. The stress is incredible if you have to manage financial challenges, right? And research has shown that the more time spent in poverty actually, I mean, almost commonsensically, increases the amount of stress you experience. And when feelings of stress, and this, of course, impacts parents, it also impacts the children. The children are able to, um, to see this. They're able to experience this. They're perceptive enough to see this. Um, and so when feelings of stress increase, um, sorry, when there are additional needs, so if you discover things like a learning disability with your child, then the stress levels will increase further because now you know you need to factor in more resources to support the child with their uh, additional needs. And what this results in is a feeling of inadequacy. So let's focus on the child. Now, we all know children with learning disabilities might feel inadequate. They compare themselves with their peers and they realize, hey, you know, my best friend's able to read very easily. My best friend's able to finish um, that writing piece in the time given by the teacher. My friend there can get nine out of 10 for spelling. I can't do any of those things. It's very apparent to the child quickly without intervention and the right support, that they are not as good as their peers. So sense of inadequacy begins to set, set in. Now add to that the issue of financial challenges, where they realize, I don't go on holidays. I've never been overseas. I don't have enough money for recess. I don't have um, the right stationery. The feelings of inadequacy then are doubled. So you have a situation where a child doesn't only feel inadequate because of their ability to learn, they're also feeling inadequate about their family situation, right? And therefore, they start to look at themselves as lesser beings. So in terms of quality of life, this greatly impacts um, their quality of life. And this taken uh, from Prof Teo's book again, to adults and kids alike, the sense of having less and being lesser is salient. And that's true. Following that, I want you guys to sit back and listen to a true story. This is a true story that I'm going to share with you. Someone that we have met um, and I think will demonstrate our concerns when it comes to children who are living in poverty conditions and have a learning disability. So it's a story of a boy whom we met when he was about 11. But if you look at his um, early years, he was, him, him and his siblings were born in prison, right? So one can already imagine what the family conditions were like. So he had very little um, permanent and stable caregiving experiences. His parents were absent. Parents were separated and um, rarely around. He was moved around from one uh, home arrangement to another. So typically while his, his siblings were somewhere else, they were separated and um, he would move from one family member to another, and eventually it came to a point that he was moved to a home. Now, he had no home language and literacy environments that were positive, and when, he did, when we did meet him, this boy had very little English language exposure. He could barely speak English, and he, he definitely couldn't read or write uh, in English. Um, clearly, there were homeschool disconnections. He was going to school as his compulsory education. He started uh, primary education at seven. Um, but he was unable to keep pace at that point already. He was lagging behind his peers. 
Um, he wasn't able to perform the tasks that were expected of him, and he developed these undesirable coping strategies. He would refuse to do tasks, but not in an aggressive way, in a passive way. He would hold his pencil and stare at the paper till it was time to hand it in and it would be blank. And he wouldn't ask for help because he didn't know how to or he didn't think that someone would be there to help him. So he began to avoid learning. Uh, he started um, refusing to do work in a passive way and that impacted him further because of um, what kind of a student he came across as, as a student who wasn't motivated, uninterested. Now, Fast forward a few years, current situation for this child, he's now a young man, he's now in trouble with the law. This is a true story. And therefore it's of no surprise to us to find that in prison populations, for example, the percentage of um, inmates with learning disabilities and or dyslexia is significantly high. So there are some statistics here, but if you just focus on the chart um, on the right for you, um, what we are looking at is within the general population, we say 10% of the population might have dyslexia. But if you look at the prison population, and this was a, a study done in Texas, 48% of the population had dyslexia. So this is a significant number. It suggests some sort of a destiny in a way, which we want to try and avoid, right? Now, apart from learning disabilities, let's talk about poverty as well. And a study found that those who were in poorer conditions or had poorer parents were more likely to be incarcerated. Right? So if you look at that, you see the bottom quintile and the fourth quintile, the, the percentage of them who are likely to be incarcerated is significantly higher. Now you combine the both then. If you talk about risk indicators, if you combine learning difficulties and poverty, then your risk indicators are doubled and therefore the, the possibility of these children making poor choices or not being given the opportunity to improve on their situation and therefore resulting in incarceration is significantly high. So what can we do to change the narrative? How can we change the story for these, uh, with this group of people? So um, again, Eric mentioned just now about how we should be looking at raising the bottom. And we have a proposal perhaps that has been submitted that might also help us um, change the situation. So the education minister, Mr. Ong Ye Kang, did say not to cap the top, but to lift the bottom. And these are some of the strategies that are in place, uh, the resourcing of schools. So special schools like Crest, Spectra, Northlight do receive more um, resources per student than other schools. So as you can see, 24,000 per student uh, who are attending uh, lessons in specialized schools. They also, he also talked about the rotation of teachers because there is also this um, issue about the, the best teachers, the most qualified teachers um, being stationed at elite schools, right? And so by rotating these teachers, there is a greater certainty that their experience and their expertise would then be spread across the population. Um, he mentioned the Public Service Commission scholarships, the PSE scholarships, are now reviewing the way they award these scholarships and reaching out to disadvantaged students, where previously you would find that 60%, uh, sorry, 80% of the students who received these scholarships came from the top uh, schools like Raffles Institution and Hua Chong Institution. Right now that number has dropped to 60%. So it's an improvement. We can see that they're reaching out to beyond the elite schools. And interestingly, they're also adjusting the way they interview these students. So in, in, with the awareness that some of these students may not be very articulate and efficiently um, explain what their ideas are and their skills are, they're reviewing it so they can still evaluate the ability of the child without purely depending on how well they speak. Um, he also talked about the opportunities for experience. Um, and we know that a lot of these elite schools have the resources to send children to attend the most um, extraordinary and exotic sort of activities, and parents who have the resources are able to do that outside of school. But um, right now, more and more schools are able to provide these experiences like fencing. I mean, when I was in school, it was unheard of, but now fencing's available, sailing. Northlight School has an equestrian program. So that's really to give them the opportunity to experience this, although they may not have the financial resources to do it outside of school. Um, he also talked about additional resources. 
about having smaller classes for weaker students and having more teachers. So that, imp that helps um, manage the learning challenges for children. The idea of equal access to opportunities, oh, I missed out a point, changes to 2019 Sec 1 posting. So previously, a lot of schools would, um, the, the elite schools, the primary schools, would almost automatically go into the elite secondary schools, right? And that system is now, has now changed. About 20% of the enrollment of these elite secondary schools are set aside for students not coming from the affiliated primary school. So again, the, the, the opportunity to access these elite, well, I should stop calling it elite, but these secondary school systems that um, were supposedly elite. Yeah? Um, then we move on to equal access to opportunities, and there is an effort to move, not, not just look into, say, preschool education or primary education, but to move from preschool all the way to adulthood to ensure that that disadvantaged families have equal access to opportunities. And they're focusing on these three groups, the disadvantaged, so here we're referring to the financially disadvantaged, those with high learning needs, and those with special educational needs. And to continue to encourage access to these elite schools, right? Um, and right now, a lot of schools are making adjustments to their enrollment policy so that students can access these school, um, these education systems um, through alternate criteria, right, rather than the pre-existing ones. Uplift, which is uplifting pupils in life and inspiring families, is a task force that's been set up um, by the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Social Family Development, and Early Childhood Development Agency. So you've got these three, um, three agencies working together to set up this task force, and they're focusing on three key areas. Long-term absenteeism and dropout rates, which, are in, which, which does impact our learners with financial challenges and learning disabilities. Parent outreach and engagement, which looks at the caregivers and how the caregivers can therefore support the children. And students' motivation. So they're using student welfare officers to actually reach out to these students who are absent from school very often. Um, they connect with these students, they counsel these students, and their effort really is to reintegrate them back into the mainstream education system. Schools also have counsellors who are trained to identify children who might be showing um, disadvantaged uh, signals. Um, so this could be learning disabilities or financial challenges. And to be able to counsel them and reintegrate them and help them find solutions so that they can continue with their learning journey. Closer to home, the Ministry of Education does help the DAS students considerably. The Ministry of Education part subsidizes fees for the DAS main literacy programs intervention, and in addition to that, provides financial assistance. Um, in 2018, 1,613 students benefited from the MOE financial assistance scheme. The DAS also does its part. In 2018, 188 students benefited from DAS bursaries. So, so we are doing some things, we are doing some things well, we are aware and recognise the need to do some things. The question of course is, is there more that we can do? Uh, are there more things that we can change and um, therefore change the story for these families? Now research has suggested a systemic level change and I mean, a suggestion here, for example, is to look at a single point of entry for service. So as a parent coming from a low, a, a financially disadvantaged background, I don't want to be going to three, four agencies. I go into one agency, which then helps to coordinate the support I need in all the areas that I need help in. Um, it also talks about continuity, for example, and that this shouldn't stop with you know, just a child's primary or secondary education. There should be continuity because your challenges evolve as you grow and as you experience different things in life. There's also the proposal to, um, uh, to look at the individual practitioner level um, and some changes there. And one of that is for us to recognize that educators are our advocates. They are the ones who speak up for our children and their families. And so it's important that we are more aware of these poverty factors, these signs um, that we can then identify, especially with children who have learning disabilities, because there is an urgent need to address these concerns. And I particularly like this one. I like it because it's called the Dream Fund, and all of us should dare to dream. Um, the Dream Fund here was proposed by Ng Yi Ming, Ng Chi Xiang, and Heather Hoi Yek, 
I think. Um, it, and it's, it came from the Economic Development and Inclusion Policy Center. So the Dream Fund is a new credit scheme, right? Um, that is money is credited to uh, each student in, through this Dream Fund Child Development Account. And what this does then is that you can access this fund to seek out whatever support you want. So this could be uh, enrichment classes, so it could be academic, like tuition and, and things like that. Or it could be talent development. It could be because you are interested in dance or you, you think you have a skill in rock climbing. So this fund enables you to overcome your challenges if that's where you want to spend your funds in or to actually aspire and achieve something that you are talented at. And the DS has the same perspective here. We, as a result of our awareness that our children have strengths and talents, we develop this set of programs called um, under the Talent Development Program. And tomorrow, you'll be witnessing some of our speech and drama arts children performing for all of you. And this has been a really an enriching experience for everyone involved. So the development of talents is a possibility with something like the Dream Fund. Now, we, we started... I know it's time for me to wrap up. I've been told that I'm running out of time. So, um, we started with a video. I'm going to end with another video. And in the first video, you saw a parent. And in this video, you'll see something similar as well. I'm Brian, 35. I work 12 hours a day, 6 days a week. I earn just enough to scrap by, just enough to provide my son with what he needs. Appropriate. 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 Pronounce it by yourself. Appropriate. It's not appropriate, it's appropriate. Appropriate. Again? Appropriate. How can you not know? You just said it yourself. Appropriate. Appropriate. How many times do I have to repeat? It's appropriate. 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 Are you even listening? Are you focusing? Do you understand? It's appropriate! I cannot stand this anymore. What else can I do? Another day, another complaint. Another beating. Nothing changes. Maybe it's just stupid. Sir, your son hasn't completed his homework again. He hardly focuses, he can barely read, and he can't write properly. At the rate he's going, he's lucky if he even makes it out of here. How many times do I have to repeat myself, Brian? Over and over again, I keep telling you about mistakes and you don't try to rectify it. Why don't you listen to me, Brian? Do you even understand what I'm saying or not? Brian, why don't you answer me when I talk to you? My name is Joe and I don't like to go to school. No matter how hard I try, I will never do well. Okay class, today I'm going to tell you the story of King Midas. King Midas was a rich king. He loved gold more than anything else in the world. One day, I struggled to keep up in class. Friends, a I'd rather really not be here. Before. King Midas, I'm here to give you a wish. I got a whole new football match tonight, you? Sometimes I find it hard to find my way home, but no one understands.
stuff like this. It's never good enough. This kind of stuff doesn't happen to anyone else. Maybe I'm just stupid. Hey, I brought home some snacks for you. You wanna eat them now? Hey, why are you crying, huh? There's no need to cry. I'm sorry I've been scolding you so much lately. I know it's hard. But you gotta try, huh? You don't give up too, okay? We both try our best. Sometimes, I want so badly to tell him things will get better. But I can't. Because I don't know if they will. So while we may have been talking a lot about um, parents and the household environment, I think this video shows us that both the parents and the children are victims of this social inequality. So it's not to blame the parents, but really this tells us that the experiences of the families and the children living with learning disabilities and poverty is something that we must be more vigilant about. This introductory presentation is really a, a call to action. It's for all of us here working with children with learning disabilities to pay more attention and be sensitive to the possibilities of poverty impacting their learning disabilities or their challenges. It's about researchers and educators doing more in terms of understanding the impact of poverty and its impact on learning in general. Often for these children and their families, we are the last line of defense. We are their advocates. We are their champions. So if we don't, who will? If we can't, who can? I think, and I'm sure you do too, that we will, we can, and we must. So I hope that the presentations you hear at the rest of this conference continues to empower you and the people that you meet inspire you to achieve more of the great work that you've already been doing. So with that, I wish you a wonderful conference and I thank you very much for your time.